invite you to turn with me, if you could, to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3. Romans, chapter 3. I don't necessarily expect uh, everyone to remember, but the last time I was on this pulpit, uh, several months ago now, I was able to bring God's Word to you from Romans chapters 1 and 2 in two separate sermons. Uh, One, looking at Romans chapter 1, focused on how the world needs the gospel. That's why Paul is so excited to bring the gospel to those that are at Rome, because he knows that uh, pagans, those that don't know God, they need the gospel that he has. And then in Romans chapter 2 and into the beginning of Romans chapter 3, he says, well, it's not actually just the world that needs the gospel out there. Everybody needs the gospel, including you who are in Rome, who maybe have heard it in some way, shape, or form, but especially the the Jewish people that might think they don't actually need it because they already have God in some way. The end point being, everyone's sinful, so everyone needs the gospel. And we'll just review a little bit of that by reading, starting at Romans 3, verse 9. We'll get into uh, where we hope to, uh, we left off at the end of verse 20, but we'll continue with our text at verse 21. We'll read just right through to the end of verse 26. So Romans 3, verse 9. This is God's Word. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So our text then for this afternoon, we take from those Two verses in Romans 3, verses 21 and 22, where Paul starts that new section in most people's Bibles. Uh, There's probably a separate heading there. In the ESV, it says, the righteousness of God through faith. Uh, So verse 21 and into verse 22. We'll read it one more time. God's word for us. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. 
We'll just leave it there as that starts another sentence. But that is God's word that will serve as our text this afternoon. In response to uh, the sermon, we hope to respond by uh, singing from hymn 48, praising the Holy Spirit for his work in spreading this gospel. Hymn 48, 1 and 2, after the sermon. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, the book of Romans is... Uh, it's, it's the big one. It's widely considered as one of the, if not the, most important book in the Scriptures. Many theologians see it as, see it as that kind of climax of the New Testament, what it's all leading to. Uh, the climax not just of the New Testament, but really of the, the, whole, the whole Bible uh, as it goes from Old Testament to New. Uh, few books have such an important place in church history and the effect that they've had on church history, uh, the lives of many important church uh, leaders, Augustine, Luther, uh, Wesley, all their lives changed drastically, specifically because of verses in the book of Romans when they read it. Uh, when William Tyndale uh, translated the New Testament into the English language uh, and published it for the first time for people to read, he often put prologues at the beginning of each book and when it came to the Romans, he at one point says this about the book of Romans. He says, For as much as this epistle, this letter, is the principal and most excellent part of the New Testament and most pure euangelion or gospel, it's the most pure gospel, uh, that is to say glad tidings and, and also a light and a way in unto the whole scripture, he says this, I think it meet that every Christian man not only know it by rote and without the book, in other words, memorize it, but also exercise himself therein ever more continually as with the daily bread of the soul. He, he keeps going on it. He says, no man truly can read it too often or study it too well. For the more it is studied, the easier it is the more it is chewed, the pleasanter it is, the more groundly it is searched, the preciouser things are found in it. So great treasure of spiritual things lieth hid therein. He's a big fan of the book of Romans. Um, and, and we all, he's saying that we all should be big fans of the book of Romans, that there is something special in this letter, uh, in just how it's framed and how it's put together, that we should delve into every detail of it. And the Lord willing, I'm going to be with you uh, next week as well uh, as part of the regular exchange. Uh, but it's good then to kind of slow down and go through the words of this text and, and just savor them and enjoy what they truly mean for us. And especially when it comes, I mean, it was a bunch of months ago, but Romans 1, Romans 2, we did very quickly um, in two sermons uh, but especially this section in Romans 3, because here you get right to the heart of what Paul is excited to say, the heart of the gospel that he's bringing everywhere he goes. And for us this afternoon, it, it's good to refresh ourselves in just how important this is, because uh, we hear the gospel regularly. Uh, we hear that word, gospel, and sometimes we can, our eyes can almost glaze over with it, uh, because it's, well, it's just that thing that the minister says, gospel, and we, we know the gospel, we love the gospel. Um, to refocus our lives and our hearts on just how glorious this must have been in that time, in that age, and how glorious it should still be for us today. That is what we hope to do as we look at these first verses as Paul introduces this gospel and basically says, you know, everyone needs this. I'm the world needs this, but even, even people that know the Bible need this gospel uh, because we're all sinful. And now I want to say, verse 21, now the gospel has come. Now, people fell short, right? Uh, that was where Romans 3, verses 19 and 20 ended off. You, you go through everybody's attempts to do righteousness, and they fail, and they fail, and they fail. Anybody who tries to do it with the law... It's not going to work, but now, 
At this time in history, Paul is saying, something special has happened, and that's why I'm going around. That's why I want to come to you at Rome. That's why I want this gospel to go out over and over again, because right now, something special has happened. This gospel, by faith or of faith, it has actually just come. It has just arrived. It just has started to be news for people. And so that's the theme, the gospel of faith has come. That's Paul's uh, introductory statement in verse 21. We're going to see that it's a gospel that contains righteousness. That's what he mentions right off the bat in this verse. And then also he mentions that this gospel of faith, it it has come and it, it comes with witnesses. It has people that have witnessed to it. So first of all, it's righteousness. The righteousness of God has been manifested. This is the big news that Paul wants people everywhere to hear, that this righteousness has come. And uh, again, just to, if you have the Bible in front of you, if you go back to Romans 1 verses 18 and 19, uh, Paul had just, uh, just, it's a couple chapters ago now, but he had introduced the whole topic of needing help by saying that the wrath of God is being revealed, this is verse 18 of chapter 1, revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In other words, everybody has been producing all kinds of evil and unrighteousness. Nobody has been able to produce the righteousness that they need. The only thing that they're getting is God's wrath coming upon them. That's what people are seeing around them as they fall further and further into sin. That's what's happening. But now... Something different has come. Righteousness has come in. Not a righteousness that we're producing ourselves, but a different kind of righteousness. This is the, this is the way of escape that the world has needed. The whole world, Paul has been saying, has basically been watching and God's wrath is getting closer and closer and closer and it's like you're trapped and you can't get out of the way of this, this, this path of, of wrath that's coming after you. But now Paul is saying, right at the nick of time, the, the the path to get off, or the way to get off of that path is here, a righteousness. And there's three characteristics about this righteousness that we can get from this text. Uh, three characteristics that we need to continue to hold on to as a church about this gospel that Paul is announcing. The first characteristic is that it is of God. The righteousness of God has come. It's repeated twice, actually, uh, in our text. Verse 22 mentions it as well, uh, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But it it comes up repeatedly. Uh, It's mentioned as God's righteousness in verse 25, His righteousness in verse 26. It's always labeled as God's righteousness. It it was already uh, labeled as God's righteousness back in chapter 1, verse 17. The righteousness of God has been revealed. But what does it mean that this is... God's righteousness, the righteousness of God. Well, it means that the, the lack of righteousness that we were, were struggling to, to produce, we, we lacked righteousness, all the goodness we failed to do so that no one was righteous, it's now been provided by God. God was, God was front and center in getting this righteousness together and, and making sure that we could actually get it. We, we wouldn't have been able to do it ourselves. And again, we shouldn't gloss over this that quickly. Uh, In a day and age where we just kind of want to skip to the good parts, and even in Christianity where uh, evangelists can can be trying to just almost get people to to get Jesus into their hearts immediately and and move on, Paul's gospel was, was rich, it was big, it was deep, and it was connected to the rest of of history. It wasn't just this one off thing. And when he's he's saying about God here connects with that. This, this is the God who has been working to get this righteousness to us for centuries, for millennium, or millennia. So this isn't, ju- it is about your relationship with Jesus Christ, but it isn't just about your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's also about your relationship with the God of this whole world, the creator of this whole world, the God who can't stand sin because he realizes how awful sin is, how much it pollutes our world and costs people pain and, and all kinds of, of frustration. 
God alone understands fully just how much better this this world was, was going to be before sin came in. So, of course, he's going to desire to get rid of sin, to, to punish those that ruined his creation. That was, that was what caused the problem in the first place, was sin coming into this world. And with God's anger at sin, it's not like Jesus, when he comes into this world, sneaks in behind the Father's back and, you know, like, I'm going to work this, work this out without him even noticing. And, oh, look, we got a solution. And it's also not like he has to come in and be like, Father, you know, calm down, like this is not that big a deal, we'll, we'll fix this. No, this is the Father's doing. This is the righteousness of God, God's work. Like that famous verse, John three sixteen says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. God is the planner of this gospel. God is the the initiator of this gospel, Martin, Lo- Martin Lloyd-Jones, a uh, commentator on, on the book of Romans, has said, it's God himself who provides the way of salvation. It's God who provides everything that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's God who sent him. It's God who gave him his task. The entire action, it, it's all from God. And, and we ought to be thankful for that because it just points to the fact that we needed outside help. That we could never have done this ourselves. And thankfully, God did not give up on us. It's His righteousness that comes to us. That's the first characteristic. The second characteristic, we have His righteousness. It's also uh, a righteousness that comes, is manifested. Manifested just means it's, been, it's shown up and has made itself obvious. So it has come, this righteousness, uh, apart from the law. That's the second characteristic. It's come apart from the law. Which is building off of what Paul just said uh, in verse 19, verse 20. Under the law, everybody is, is under the law, and they can't seem to get anything going under the law. It, it, they fail over and over again. Keeping God's commands in a way that God would be happy with? Be a righteous person? No, it, it's not going to happen. It's why we're all in need in the first place. But Paul's gospel that he's so excited about is a gospel apart from the law. Again, we we shouldn't miss how big that is. For the thousands of years since those first humans, Adam and Eve, lived and, and fell into sin, people have been under the law. It was a weight on them that they had to keep. Right after sin happened, God came to Adam and Eve, He put them under the curse, and it was all the effects of rebelling against Him that they experienced. The frustration that they experienced, and the continued sin that they experienced, and the death that they ended up experiencing. And you go through all the people in the Old Testament. You go to Cain, you go to Noah, you go to Abraham, on and on down the line and over and over again. Nobody is is succeeding in keeping the law. No one is producing this righteousness that they need fully. But now it's not just that there is some good news or something neat has happened. This This is why it's so big. This is the the earth-shattering event that is unparalleled in world history. Nothing has ever happened like it before, and nothing has ever happened like it since. Whereas everything before was under the law, now all of a sudden there is a way to, to get out from under the law. There is a righteousness that you can get apart from keeping the law, and it's being made available just now. It's being manifested, this righteousness. It, It's come. It's something we need to keep in mind at the heart of Christianity is this truth. We're only able to be saved, to be right with God, however you want to say it. It's all outside of the law, outside of us being good enough, uh, keeping the commandments well enough, uh, looking like good enough Christians. That's not how we are saved. That's not how we are righteous before God. That's not how God looks at us and smiles at us and says, you are my well-beloved child. It's not going to be by doing all these different things under the law. To be under the law, that is to be strictly performance-based. And that is 
ultimately to be, uh, Paul says it later in Romans 6, to be a slave to the law. But Christians are not slaves to the law. They've been set free. What does a church need to continue to keep in order for it to be a healthy church? You could list a lot of different things. Some people would, would say, well, we just have to make sure everything, hold on to all the, the things that we have and make sure nothing changes. Other people would say, well, we've got to keep, keep uh, changing, keep making sure uh, we're, in a sense, always reforming and, and a, a, attempting to make sure that, that we're adapting to the times. The heart of the healthy church is making sure that the gospel that is preached is the gospel that is apart from the law. That Jesus Christ, His righteousness is being offered freely to those who receive it by faith. This gospel of faith, which has this righteousness. All the other things will fall or rise up, but will be successful or will fail based on whether or not that truth is kept. We are not to be a church where performance is the basis for you being right with God, but where people are clinging to the righteousness that God has provided in Jesus Christ. And that leads to the third characteristic of this gospel that Paul is so excited about. It's apart from the law, it's it's from God, and it is a righteousness, says verse 22, through faith in Jesus Christ. Through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the replacement of the law for getting righteousness. Faith. Faith is what gets you righteousness. Faith is, is the, the heart of this gospel. That's why, uh, as a sermon series, when I did this in Living Word, the, the title of the sermon series was The Gospel of Faith. The essential distinction, if you want to put it that way, of what Paul is bringing to the Romans is that it is, if any gospel, if you're going to describe it, it's the gospel of faith. You see it, it's mentioned a couple of times right in succession here um, in these verses. Through faith in Jesus Christ, for all who believe, there's your faith, believing. Um, It says it again uh, later on uh, about this, to be received by faith at the end of verse 25. Faith gets at the heart of it. And remember... Paul had mentioned this actually earlier in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, when he said that this righteousness of God is revealed, it's, it's come, and it's from faith and for faith. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. He's, he's basically saying with those words, uh, everything happens, it, it comes to people through faith, and it's for people with faith. It all has to do with faith. It's faith. Everything is faith. In and out, from faith, for faith. Because the righteous shall live by faith. And now he's clarifying that, what he said earlier, and saying, it's faith in Jesus Christ. Not just believing in anything, you're believing in Jesus Christ. Trusting that he has done what you needed to do for you. And Paul's going to go on to explain exactly how Jesus hold this off in verses 24 and 25 with some words that take some explaining, propitiation, being justified by His grace. But the bottom line here is that the righteousness of God is available through what Jesus Christ did for you. The only thing you have to do is accept it, believe it, and trust it. And and what a contrast with the way things were, with with how stuck the world was, how in need everyone was. And and now Paul is going around saying something has changed. A new era has dawned, uh, a new age. The the old age of the law with the Old Testament and Israel, that's ended. The new age in Christ, believing in Him as your way to get the righteousness of God, that has just started happening. It's, It's here. It has come. It's a special age. And Paul goes on to talk about how that leads to, to everyone, uh, everyone having the opportunity to, to believe and, and so be made right with God and, and become united in that. And we'll hope to talk about that, I believe, next week as well, Lord willing. But for now, I'll just limit myself to, to this comment here as we look at these 
three characteristics. It's of God. It's apart from law. It, it's through faith in Jesus Christ. Those are the three. This is the reason Paul is so excited. This is the reason why we should never kind of gloss over the gospel itself. It is surprising. It is, it is so special. It is earth-shatteringly different than what had been. It's why Paul is, is ready to go to Rome even though people are chasing him down, even though his name is, is in the mud. People are, are oh, that, the Apostle Paul's coming. Is he the one that's stirring up all that controversy? Everywhere he goes, there's riots in the streets. He's been arrested, like, how many times? He's gotten whipped. He's gotten beaten. He's coming. And, and Paul, he's not even worried about that. He just knows that this is something worth passing on. It is good news. It is great news. It is the news that has never been matched ever since. And of course, then he's, he's willing to do whatever it takes to pass it on. It's life-changing news. Now, some people would look at an Apostle Paul who is going through all this and, and see, well, that's like one of those those crazy people, one of those radicals, you know. Some, some religions have radical people who are willing to do some pretty crazy things in order to be you know, super pious and super devout. And, well, maybe Paul is just kind of like that. He's, he's going around, he's doing this because he wants to be the best Christian out there in his new religion. But that's not, that's, that is way off from Paul's angle here. He, he's not trying to be extra devout. And we know that because because it goes exactly against what he's saying. He's excited to bring this gospel because he can't wait to tell people the good news that trying to be super devout and giving up your life in order to be super devout doesn't earn you anything. It gets you nowhere. He did that. He tried that. Got the t-shirt. He's, he's done with it. No, he, it didn't work. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's done with that. It's actually, he's announcing, the devoutness of God in Christ Jesus. That is the big difference. God has come. God has performed all the giving your whole life for something. Because Jesus Christ gave his whole life to die for our sins. That's the big difference. God came down and earned that righteousness for us that we could never get ourselves by being super pious, by being perfect. And Paul's love for God and for, for people in seeing what God has done, that's what compels him to go out and tell this great news. It's news that's glorious to God, and, and he, he thinks God deserves this now. And also, this is the balm, the cure, the, the healing that every person needs if only they would just hear it and believe it. He's not trying to stir up controversy as if that will get him greater recognition. He's simply excited because the world has changed and everyone needs to hear about it. That's the, the, the meteorite of the gospel landing in that day and age. And it caused ripple effects throughout the Roman Empire as Paul went with it all over the place, as his followers went with it all over the place. That's back then. What about us when we hear the gospel now? What about us when we read through Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3, Romans 4, when we hear Paul talking about this? Where is our excitement level at? Where is our level of willingness to, to talk about what happened in history that was so, indeed, earth-shattering? Are you thinking of how glorious this good news is? How countercultural it is for a, a society that, that has all these different things that you're supposed to do in order to live a, a happy life? Are you thinking of, of how life saving and how life giving and freeing this gospel is? Or is it easier to, to more dwell on, you know, not wanting to interfere with anybody else's life, not wanting to be looked at as one of those crazy people that is all in for Jesus or something like that. But why should we think so little of this so great a gospel? So different, so special, so history changing. 
And as if to prove that he's not getting this out of nowhere, uh, Paul then goes on to describe our second point, though, that there's a witness to this gospel, that it, people have been talking about it for a while. So that's our second point. It's mentioned in the second half of verse 21. It's, it's a, a righteousness apart from the law, but it is a righteousness that the law and the prophets bear witness to, he says. They bear witness to it. Now, law and prophets, uh, if you've read through the Gospels before, you know that Jesus often lists those things together when he's, when he's talking about the Old Testament. In fact, people in Paul's day, Jesus' day, that's how they described the Old Testament. That was their lingo for it. If you just say, well, the Scriptures say this, they would just say, the law and the prophets say this. So Paul is saying, the Old Testament, the Scriptures that we had beforehand, they bear witness to this righteousness. It's not, it's special, it is, it changes the course of history, but it's not entirely unexpected. It's not as though God, out of the blue, all of a sudden did a 180 and and changed his plans. No, this was the plan all along. And Paul is claiming the Old Testament is full of witnesses to this. Now, he can say that, uh, and he doesn't in this instance Go out and prove it. There's not a whole list of Old Testament passages of how this was the way it always was. He will eventually get to it a bit more in Romans chapter 4 and how this fit with Abraham. But really, we could go all the way back to uh, the Garden of Eden, to Genesis 3.15, and and the promise that, that the descendant of the woman was going to be struck by the serpent, but that descendant of the woman would still strike the head of the the serpent, and in, in a sense, then kill the serpent, crush the serpent, that that would be a way to solve the problem of sin and Satan. As some have pointed out that Cain and Abel, with their sacrifices immediately after the fall into sin, God was pleased with one sacrifice, God was not pleased with the other sacrifice. You're already getting hints that a, a sacrifice is needed in order for that serpent to be crushed, in order for God to be pleased, some sort of way of being right with God. Righteousness. And as Romans 4 will go on to say, Abraham, he, he shows above all that righteousness comes by faith. All the things that he did, he had to, he had to do by faith and was then an example for, for the ages to come. But there were other things that he did as well, promises of, of the fact that he would be a blessing to all the nations. Uh, that, that was a hint of something that was going to come through Abraham and his descendants. Um, circumcision with the blood that needed to be shed in order for to, to be in the presence of God and be right with God. Genesis 17. Uh, the almost sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22. They're all picturing a time where the world would be blessed again through a sacrifice to God. And you can go through all the offerings and sacrifices, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They all show the same thing. Sacrifices needed to bring forgiveness for sins against the law. And, and, but that's just one aspect of what Jesus Christ did and what Paul is talking about in Romans 3. There's so much more. I mean, you could go through the, the Psalms 22, 31, 69. They all point to somebody that needs to suffer in such a deep and, and shameful way. All fulfilled by Jesus Christ on the cross uh, for our righteousness. Or you can think of, of the Psalms that speak of a, a kingship that's going to, to last before God forever. And how is that going to happen if there isn't this righteousness that is needed first. Well, you, you have it in this king. Psalm 2, Psalm 21, Psalm 72. We sang Psalm 110, Psalm 132. They all point to this kind of redeemer king. And I could go on with the, the prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah. These pointing to a servant who is going to be the Lord, our righteousness, a righteous branch, a righteous sprout. It, it's all over the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament really points 
to the salvation in Jesus Christ. And that's not just me saying that. That's not just something that the church has come up with. That's something that Jesus himself said when he was on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to those two men in all the scriptures, all the Old Testament, the things concerning himself. It was all over. They bear witness to what Jesus was doing with this righteousness of God. And, and people knew, some people knew that the prophets of the Old Testament had inquired, says First Peter. They were asking when this time of the Messiah would come, when the things predicted about his suffering and the glories that would come after would take place. They knew that something was up, that something like this was going to happen with suffering, with salvation, with righteousness. It, it's all there. They knew it. They, they, they were looking forward to it. And yet, of course, it all ended up happening even in a greater way than they even realized. But this is why the book of Romans is seen as such a climax to the Bible because it pulls all of these different passages together, it pulls all of these different teachings together into Jesus Christ and what it means that Jesus Christ came into this world as the history-changing Messiah that He is. Paul's words here in Romans 3, 21 and 22, they remind us of why we, we don't just read the Old Testament and, and forget about the God of, of the Old. We don't just read the New Testament and forget about the God of the Old Testament as if he, He's not the same God, or we don't treat the Old Testament as if it's outdated and has lost its importance or its use. No, it all is leading to and pointing to Jesus Christ. And makes what happens in Jesus Christ all the more fascinating, all the more glorious and praiseworthy. You could put it this way then, that the church that loses an appreciation for the overall story is losing something of the, the specialness of the gospel of God. This gospel that God had been working out and planning and moving forward through the ages. We call that the, the history of redemption. And as Reformed churches, we've, we've tried to hang on to that dearly and, and promote that. And, and it's something that we should never lose. Because it, it indeed is what God was pointing to through Paul right here in verse 21. When Paul is the most excited to tell the gospel, he points out that it's all based on redemptive history. What God was doing. What God was planning. So to hold on to that safeguards us from getting tossed to and fro by, by every wind of teaching. It also pushes us to appreciate in a new, great, powerful way just all that God is and does throughout thousands of years of history. The long-awaited righteousness this world has so desperately needed has come. It's God's, it's, it's apart from the law. It frees us. It's in Christ by faith. Jesus witnessed to the disciples about it. And the disciples started witnessing to the world about it. Because they saw this, this was something different. This was something special. This was world changing. And you too are disciples of Jesus Christ. Will you not also witness, be taken over with excitement by just how great of a salvation God is working in this world? He is our great God, the great Redeemer, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who deserves our lives given in devotion to Him. May He receive the praise. Amen.